Hello, everyone. How are you doing? When uh, Phil asked me to do this conference, I was really excited, and I noticed that the day was the day after the election, and I was like, oh, that's awesome, because we're all going to be in a really great mood. <laughs> so then I was like, okay, and then my wife asked me this morning, hey, so when is your time slot uh, after lunch? And she goes, boy, you are not batting very well, right? I promise I will make this not very yawny. I promise that it is different than a normal talk you see at conferences like this because I do have some unique experiences. And I want to share you a little bit about my journey and some research that we did at Google, we called it Project Aristotle, about what makes effective teams. And the best part about this research is that at Google, I get to stand on the shoulders of giants. So most of the research was done by Julia Razovsky, and if you read the New York Times article, the article is mostly about her. I did have a little blurb in there, but it was mostly about her and her struggles and her research. But I have a little personal bent on it, so hopefully you'll uh, indulge me a little bit. So I want to open with uh, asking you three questions. Just think a little bit about what kind of team you're on right now. And then what kind of teammate are you? And finally, what kind of leader are you? Just kind of keep those things top of mind as we go through and explore for the next 45 minutes or so. Let me tell you a little bit about my experience with Teams. If you read the bio, and maybe you didn't, some of you may know or may not, my first job out of school was I was a police officer. Right out of college, landed as a, as a cop, and my first experience on a patrol team wasn't that great. It's a paramilitary organization. There is a very, very high pressure to conform and not be different. Surprise, surprise, police officers can be very conservative, xenophobic, racist, homophobic, name the phobic. They're there. I worked in a very white Republican town I was the lone Asian police officer, so everyone knew who I was. And so I felt this real pressure. I felt pressure about me as a person. I wanted to perform well. And on a patrol team, the last thing you wanted to be seen is weak. You want to be just like them. It's like peer pressure on steroids. If you think high school peer pressure was bad, be a rookie cop and do the job and try not to feel that pressure. There's a lot of it. And really what they expect from you is to go out and do the job. Just do your best and go out there. And you're a generalist, so you do everything. You're the whole hand. And you're driving around, you find and arrest bad people. Most of the time they're bad guys, right? You interview, you interrogate, investigate, collect evidence, do all that stuff. You're, you're everything. Well, what I found was I had to censor myself quite a bit. Political discussions would happen. I wouldn't say anything. I would just nod my head and kind of chuckle at their jokes. They would say, very rarely there were racist slurs, but there were definitely homophobic slurs going on. And again, I, I would love to be able to tell you that I raised my hand and I said, you know what, I am not okay with those words. And I'm not okay with the thoughts behind those words. I would love to be able to say, say that I did that, but I didn't because I wanted to fit in. So I could not bring my whole self to work. I kind of felt like I was just, Matt, the police officer was very different than Matt, the person. And that was a big struggle for me because before, and obviously not that I had legions of experience, this is my first real job after all, but I never really had that bifurcation of personality before. And I really struggled with that. Interestingly enough, four years into my career as a police officer, I joined the SWAT team. SWAT team is a very stringent selection process. It's almost as hard as getting hired at Google. <laughs> Obviously not a very intellectually high intellectual bar, but there is a bar, right? You have to be physically fit, you have to be able to shoot, you have to be able to run and jump, you have to be able to repel, you have to be able to do a lot of stuff. And pass an oral interview and be vetted by your peers and by the people that are already on the existing SWAT team. Well, actually, I made it all the way through 
and I joined the SWAT team, and I kind of expected the SWAT team to be an extension of the patrol team. Actually, it was quite different. To my surprise, it was actually a great experience. We had a sergeant on the SWAT team who actually really believed that in order for us to execute at our best, we really had to, in our hearts and minds, believe that the plan we were about to execute was the best one. And so even if we didn't have a lot of time, he would still ask for input, and he really meant it. He wouldn't just say, OK, this is what we're going to do. The difference between patrol and SWAT, patrol, you do everything, like I said before. You're the whole hand. On SWAT, you're a finger. My job was to be on the entry team. I was the number two person on the entry team, and Jimmy was in front of me. It was me, and Steve was behind me. And we'd breach, open the door, and rush in. And we each had an assignment. Now, as you can imagine, pretty high level of dependability, right? Because if I make a mistake, Gmail's not going down. If I make a mistake, people can die. Jimmy and Steve depended on me doing the right action. So that's why at Google, when people are running around and say, oh my god, we pushed a bad config and Gmail's down, I'm just like, it's all right. <laughs> no one's going to die. We'll figure it out. OK? <laughs> but anyway. We had this different environment on the SWAT team. Obviously, the stakes are high. When you're on patrol, my favorite call, it was like, hey, Matt, you got to go to a barking dog call. Why? Because the barking dog is bothering a neighbor. Or his shopping cart ran into my Mercedes, and now look at this big dent. Oh my god. Right? You'd have that on patrol. Or you'd have other things. But on SWAT team, you don't get that. Right? On the SWAT team, you're, you got called because there's something serious that's happening, usually in progress. It's a robbery that went bad, or a hostage situation, or a high-risk search warrant, something along that, those lines. So the, risks, the, the stakes are already higher on the SWAT team. And there was always usually an element of danger. One thing we would do, Jimmy was in front, me and Steve, is that we wouldn't even say anything, but before we did the breach, we would turn around and touch our fists together, and look at, look at each other. Basically, what we were saying is, I got you. Don't worry about it. I will do my job, and I will protect you. And we didn't have to say anything, right? But there was an esprit de corps there because, again, my physical safety depends on what they do. And along with the inclusive environment that the sergeant had created, it was a really, really great experience. Very different, my patrol team experience versus my SWAT team experience. And what I really found is that I was always chasing after that SWAT team experience after I had to leave police work because of an injury. So what happened was I had to leave, hurt my back really bad, and I couldn't be a police officer anymore. And I did, I won't bore you with the trials and travails of what happened. It's just kind of an interesting story, but we don't have time today. Let's just say, long story short, I ended up in a technical job. And I was a manager of a team of 10 running the walmart.com website. And at this point in my career, I had never logged into a Unix system. So Oracle database, didn't know what you're talking about. Front end web servers, Apache, no, I didn't know. I got this job because I was good at operations, and basically the VP knew me and recommended me, and that was it. So I knew I was very lucky to be in that role. Luckily, I had some people that were gracious enough to teach me. But I was so green and so new that I spent all of my cycles just getting myself technically up to speed, just so they would respect me for the ability to be able to write a simple bash script, right? keep the website running, fill in a shift for them if I had to. And so therefore, I never spent any time creating a vision for the team, improving processes, and all of that. I was just massively trying to get a, reduce my technical debt, my gaps. So later on, what happened is that people would complain because they didn't feel like they had a manager because I really wasn't a manager. I was just trying to be better. And I wanted to be popular, so I made the popular decisions, not the right ones. All of these things, as a very junior manager, this is what, what happened.
But I took those lessons and I moved to a, a different company and I found that I took on another team. And this was a software company and the dynamics of that team were everyone was unhappy. And so my idea was I'm just gonna make them happy. Well, that was a miserable failure. <laughs> you can't do that, right? <laughs> I tried and I tried to be their friend. Also, not, not what you wanna be doing as a leader, right? Again, these are all things that I just felt like, well, uh, I want to get to that SWAT team, that, that great dynamic again. How do I do it? I didn't know the, the algorithm to get there. And so then I figured, well, it's the reason why is because the SWAT team was handpicked. So if I could hire my own team, then I'm sure that I could create that experience again, right? And so I got hired by another tech company, and they said, hey, Matt, what we want you to do is build out an operations center. You can hire and fire people. Just get it up, get it running, do it the way you want. You write all the policies, all the procedures. You go. Give you a budget and everything. Sweet. So I spent time. I handpicked a bunch of people. I hired them all, put them together in a pod. And guess what happened? The team sucked, right? It was not what I had envisioned. And again, it was like, what am I doing wrong? Moved to another tech company and another one. Finally ended up landing at Google. I know, a guy that hadn't logged into Unix and then somehow, seven years later, it lands at Google. Again, I am the luckiest person alive. They still haven't figured out I don't belong. Right. <laughs> so I got to Google and I figured, okay, the hiring bar at Google is fairly high and they must have figured this out. Okay. I'll, I'll fix that in a second. They must have figured this out, right? They have the brightest and the best. So they must have thought about how teams work and they have the, the right sauce. And so therefore I took over a team in SRE and guess what? You know the answer, teams weren't any better, right? They weren't melding any better, they weren't working as a team and in fact, in some ways it was arguably worse than other places I had been, even though they were the brightest and the best. So Julia came along and she had similar experiences if you've read the article about her post-grad work, or actually it was graduate work. And she thought about what would be the differentiator between an effective team and not so effective teams. And the quote that she heard from somebody that sparked this research was the people I work with define everything. She overheard that. And she knew, as being part of people analytics at Google, that we make data-driven decisions. There is a team at Google that is constantly performing social experiments on us. My favorite one is that the M&Ms in the micro kitchens, they used to have them on the same level as the coffee makers in a jar with a scoop. And then they said, huh, I think the Googlers are eating too many M&Ms. So let's move them to a shelf down below the shelf with the coffee maker. Guess what? Consumption went down. So then they said, let's get rid of the scoop and let's get 100 calorie packs and then we'll move it even lower. And again, consumption went down. And then they sent out a report saying, hey, by the way, last quarter, 7 million fewer sugar calories were consumed by Google because we had moved to the M&Ms and put them in 100 calorie packs in the jar. And now what they've done is hidden the M&Ms in a drawer and they're way in the back of the drawer. Okay, all the kale chips and the apples and you know, all the good stuff's in the front, way in the back, you'll see some M&Ms now. But what I do is one of my favorite games at Google is when I go to different offices, I look at the micro, way the micro kitchen is and I'm trying to figure out which experiment they're running. Because <laughs> we are the biggest guinea pigs, trust me. They are always running something. So anyway, they do base things on data and analytics. We had a, a similar study about four years ago about what makes the best managers, and it was called Project Oxygen. In other words, there's got to be some attributes that differentiate best managers from the ones that aren't so good. And they did a couple year study, they interviewed people, and they came up with these attributes. And I won't go through all of them, but you probably all heard something like this before, right? It's no secret. 
you don't micromanage, you're a good communicator, you take personal interest, you have a clear vision and strategy. And Julia saw the results of this Project Oxygen and said, huh, along with that quote about the people I work with define everything, she was thinking, well, how about we come up with a study that differentiates the effective teams from the not so effective? And all these slides will be available, so you don't have to worry about it. Again, what sets the best apart from the rest? Of course, the first thing you have to do is define what effectiveness is, right? Well, what is an effective team? How, how do you even start to define that? It's a little subjective. So what she did is she talked to executives. Hey, which teams do you think are effective? Then she talked to tech leads, managers, a lot of people in this room. Not managers, directors, might be higher ups here, but leaders. What teams are effective in your mind? And then finally, she asked the people actually doing the work. Is your team effective? What team is effective if it's not your team? Or if your team is, what is it? Rigorous study. She took two years interviewing 200 interviews. There was 180 teams involved, all kinds of inputs. I want to say there was over 3,000 lines of code and 170,000 keywords coded or something like that. Anyway, real rigorous study. It's been published. And again, what we were trying to find was, just like Project Oxygen had the attributes of a great manager, what we were trying to do was find the attributes of an effective team. And we had a lot of guesses. She had a lot of guesses coming into it. It was kind of like, well, I bet you the effective teams have a lot of high performers, or they've been at Google for a long time, or they're co-located. Anyone here have this thing where it's like, well, if the software engineers are next to the UX people, that's going to cause this like automatic synergy and things are going to be better. How many people have heard that before? Uh -huh. OK. These are all the things we thought would be important. And a lot of them were wrong. Here's the things that we really found. Psychological safety, dependability. Structure, meaning, and impact. Meaning is personal meaning, not meaning for the company. And we'll dive into mostly psychological safety because it is, it is the foundation of making a highly effective team. The other big takeaway is how a team works together is far more important than who's on the team. So forgive me in my sports analogy. Any Giants fans out there? Okay, what happened in 2010, 2012, and 2014? <laughs> I guess there's not a, it's not a good baseball fan. That was a bad one. Anyway, they won the World Series. And in each of those years, if you looked at their rosters and then compared them to the people they were playing, they were actually inferior position by position. But as a team, they want it. Three out, of five, three out of five years, three out of five years, which is not by accident, right? The Warriors a couple of years ago, not quite last year, but the Warriors a couple of years ago, again, plays like a team. They definitely had superstars, but they played very well together. And again, it's, it's how the team works. And if you read the abstract, my analogy there is that what Google was really good at by default was creating all-star teams the best program manager, the best UX, the best coder, right? And put them, in a, put them on a team and then expect it to just gel. Well, that doesn't work because what we found is it's really how the team works together, not who comprises the team. So a championship team will beat an all-star team most of the time. And what we want to do as leaders is build championship teams. With psych safety at the bottom, and we'll dive into it a little further, but basically you feel safe taking risks. You feel safe sharing vulnerabilities. Dependability. I can depend on others to get done, and not just get done, but get done with high standards. And then structure and clarity. There's clearly defined roles. And finally, sorry, there's meaning, which again, it's personal meaning, personally meaningful to you. My example is that we have a safe browsing team that keeps malware and bad actors off, off the internet, right? And they have an extreme passion for this. 
personally meaningful to them. Finally, impact. You can see the impact of your work. What we found on the sales side, it's nice because on the, on the tech side, it's a little hard to evaluate who's effective. You can't go by like lines of code, right? And you can't say X feature was better than Y feature. But luckily on the sales side, it's pretty clear, right? You either hit your numbers or you didn't. And what we found was that the safe teams beat their numbers by an average of 17%, and unsafe teams were actually missing by almost the same amount, actually 19. Now, there was a little human cry when this was presented at Google because people were like, excuse me, Julia, what about the directionality? How do we know? Like, how do we know, like, are they safe because they hit, beat their numbers? Or, or did they beat their numbers because they're safe, right? And so what they did, they took that to heart and actually tracked teams over multiple quarters and took new teams in. Consistently, we found the same result. So we're pretty confident in this conclusion. Also, teams that scored high in psych safety from the executive viewpoint by two to one were viewed as being more effective. So because psychological safety is so important, let's spend a little bit of time on that. Because the shared belief by, held by team members that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. On my patrol team as a police officer, the philosophy was, it's the Japanese proverb, right? The nail that sticks up is going to get hammered back down. This is the reverse of that, right? If you have a psychologically safe team, there's no bad question. You can express yourself without fear of ridicule or rejection. And it's really important that when someone takes a personal risk, that the reaction of the team of that risk is in a positive manner. We break it down even further into voice, trust, and inclusion. So does everyone on your team have a voice? And this includes having the people that don't talk very much. A lot of people love to talk. I'm one of them, right? But we got to make sure that the people that don't talk very much have a voice. Also, people process information differently. Some people want to think about it. Other people love shooting from the hip. But you need to be aware of that. And so when we have a meeting when we're going to talk about something on my team, what we do is I say, hey, we're going to talk about X topic on Wednesday. Think about this and come to the meeting with some ideas. Because some people are going to be very uncomfortable trying to think of formulate idea on the spot. But if you give them a couple days, they're really going to have some great juicy ideas to bring to the table. But does everyone have a voice? Does everyone feel like they can speak without fear of reprisal? Second one is trust. Do I trust others on the team, both on a personal and professional level? If you read the article, what I did was not everyone knew that I had personal health struggles. And I, I wasn't exactly sure. Actually, I wasn't sure even up to the point where I started opening my mouth if I was going to share it or not. And for those of you that don't know, I have advanced stage 4 cancer. And I know that I am not going to make it to 60. I, I know that, and I know that, and I know that my body will fail me at some point. Right now, I'm able to work and do things like this, thankfully. And I was afraid a little bit to share this, but at the same time, I wanted to, them to see me as a human being, not just as their manager. And you know what? I'm fallible. I have struggles just like you, and I want to share this with you. Now, if you read the article, it doesn't take an ailing manager, right? It's not, I wasn't trying to play the sympathy card or what my wife says, the cancer card, like when I bought my new car. <laughs> <laughs> I would have said no, but OK. Right? But I wasn't trying to get their sympathy. What I was trying to show them is like, I trust you to, to, to share this with you. And I'm, gonna, I'm OK with being vulnerable in front of you. And actually, it actually ended up spawning this really great conversation where other people had shared their struggles. One, I had no idea, but she had a really, really long struggle with food and her relationship with food. And she told us the whole thing. And we had no idea what was going on, right? And again, I'm not saying that 
that's the kind of meaning you have to have. I'm not trying to say, okay, we need to go to a campfire and play the guitar and sing Kumbaya. That's not what it's about. It's just about you modeling being vulnerable and fallible in front of your people in whatever form that takes. So that's an element of trust. Inclusion. Now, inclusion and diversity are hot words nowadays. It is, however, very, very important to think about as a leader. I've got two women on my team, and as a woman in tech, they are definitely in a non-dominant group. We obviously have a massive problem across all of technology that we do not have enough women. And we're doing something wrong because women aren't attracted to the field, right? And I am a male in tech. I'm in the dominant group. I need to work really, really hard to understand, to try to understand the best I can their struggles and what causes them not to stay in tech or be attracted to it in the first place. Now, I'm very fortunate that both of the women on my team are very confident and assertive, and I ask them very, very succinctly, please tell me when I do something, say something, do whatever, that in any way makes you feel not included. And call me on it, please. Because as a male in tech, I will never understand what you're going through, but you can help me. And they do, and I appreciate it. I have a Muslim on my team. As like a lot of Americans, fairly ignorant of what that means, right? Other than, oh, there's some rules, and I know they pray every day at, at a certain time, and blah, 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 right? But I really reached out to him and say, hey, you know what? I want to make sure that you feel included. So I want to make sure that if we're doing a dinner outing, I don't do it during the month that you're fasting, right? And I don't base my offsites always around alcohol. Because we all love to go to bars and bourbon tasting and say, oh, wait a minute. That's not being inclusive of him. So being inclusive takes a lot of work. However, the people on your team will appreciate you deeply for doing it, even if they notice you just making an effort. You don't have to be perfect. So those are three elements there of how we break down psych safety. Here's some quotes about unsafe teams. The second one really resonated with me. I get a bit scared to speak my mind. There's been so many people that have been here so long, or we have this thing called imposter syndrome. At least uh, when I joined Google, I certainly had it. And I did my Gmail rotation, and I went to Zurich, and all of these senior Gmail people were there. And here's me showing up. Hi, everybody. I'm the new Gmail SRE. Oh, you don't know anything. Right. And I didn't. And I kind of felt this. I really felt like I couldn't ask questions. I was just supposed to know. Heads down, read it, Matt. Learn it. The top one, too, our team meetings don't always feel like a safe zone for questions. Condescending, aggressive, and not aggressive in a really overt way, just even minor things, what we call microaggressions. It's like, oh, that's never going to work, right? That can really, those kinds of statements can really hurt time and time again. Here's some responses. These are verbatim from Googlers about safe teams. What I try to emphasize on my team is number three. None of these are from my team, by the way. I have a new, what we call a Noogler. I have a new person on my team. It's just like his second week. And all of my teammates are emphasizing this again and again. First of all, the Google production stack is so complex, there's not one person that can know it all, soup to nuts. It's just not possible to be an expert on all of it. So that's OK if you have to ask questions. And it's OK to make mistakes. The bottom one's a favorite of mine, too, especially the last sentence. Everyone is open to questions from anyone at any time, and no question is considered dumb. Again, it sounds kind of like common sense, right? But even though it's common sense, it doesn't mean it actually gets done. What I found in my 50-something years on Earth is that people know what to do, but they often don't do what they know. Look, we all heard the golden rule before, right? 
It's very, we all have heard it. How many people practice that on a daily basis? Certainly not the people on the road that I've encountered. So what can you do? This is blatantly stolen, by the way, from Amy Edmondson. She has a great TEDx talk on this topic. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend you watch it. I have the link there when you get the slides distributed. This is her take on psych safety. So frame of work is a series of learning problems, not execution problems. So what I really try to do on my team is there is two ways to set up a team. There's actually many more ways, but the, the, the two dichotomies, the dichotomy I want you to, to frame for you is this, is that at Google, we hire certain types of individuals, and I'm sure at your companies too. I'm not trying to say Google's better. Okay, we're not. Is that we have jobs because we get results, consistently good results, right? I mean, that's why we have jobs. And we're on, we're at work, and we're performing well, and that's what you call a performance environment. Okay, what's the problem with that, though? The problem with that is that you're always on, you're always expected to perform, and you're always expected to produce. You're not doing a lot of learning. Right? On the corollary, on the other hand, what you want is set up a learning environment. Like, think about when you're in school and you had a cohort working on a project, and none of you were subject matter experts at it. And you were asking questions like, I don't know, is this the right thing, or how does this work? I don't even know. Well, we read this and try this. Let's try that. Let's try this. And then, in a learning environment, it's OK to try something and fail. In a learning environment, it's OK to suggest any old idea. It doesn't matter, right? Because then you're out there, you're producing diversity of thought. That's what you want to be doing as a leader. So model curiosity and ask questions. A lot of times as leaders that we'll get asked direct questions because, and a lot of times we do have to give direct answers. I mean, we have a job because we're leaders and we're supposed to know the answers, right? However, if it's not really required to give the answer at the time, what I do is just do the judo thing and say, that's a great question. What do you think? And not even answer it and get a discussion going. And also, what I try to do is ask a lot of questions myself. Because again, they see the leader, well, he doesn't know everything, and it's OK. And it's like, excuse me, what is GFE2 again? I'm sorry. Forgive my ignorance, but what, what is this again? And they'll go, oh, yeah, that's the thing, blah, blah, blah. OK, cool, thanks. You know, then they'll understand, oh, well, it's actually OK to ask questions. Again, not rocket science, right? You lead by example. But again, you do have to practice it. It's not going to happen automatically. And then finally, admit your own fallibility. Once a quarter, we have a team meeting where half the meeting is all about just epic failures. And it could be the ones we've done at Google, push to bad config, whoopsie, google.com went down. right? Or it's things that happen other places. My, fav my famous one was that on Mission Impossible opening weekend, I was working at Sony for Lowe's Theaters and pushed the wrong button and stirred the CO2 detectors, and all the power went out on 16 theaters. And I got a personal phone call from the CFO of Lowe's. I can't repeat what he said. <laughs> but people hear that. It wasn't funny at the time. I was not having a good day. Okay, But it's funny now. But those are the kind of things it's like, hey, you know what? We've all been there. We've all made a mistake. We've all done this oopsie, wait a minute. Did I mean to push the, oh no. Or I ran the command on the production environment that was supposed to be on QA. Uh, unsaid. <laughs> you know? How do I control C out of this? What's going on? Right. But admit your own fallibility. Again, they, that way you're getting away from the performance environment. If they see you as like this, oh my god, he's great. He writes like code like the Matrix, right? It's just beautiful. And all his algorithms are perfect. And he understands big O and everything. He's awesome. He or she is awesome. I'll never be that way. I've got to do my best all the time. That's not what you want to embody. right? You want to embody that, yes, sometimes I write really, really great code. Sometimes my code really sucks. Or I think I write really great code. And two weeks later, looking at it, I'm like, did I, did I write that? Oh my god, that's awful. right? OK, maybe it's a month later, two months. So admit your own validability. Again, how a team works 
is more important than who's on the team. I, can't re I cannot emphasize this enough. You can do this with any team. In closing, what I want to tell you is that you have tremendous power as leaders to create the team that you want and make the team the most effective that they can be. And it all of it takes is little things here and there. But the main thing to think about is that create an environment where people feel safe. Create an environment where people feel like they can bring their whole self into work and they don't have to censor themselves. That doesn't mean they can say anything they want, right? Of course not. We have to be inclusive for everybody. However, what it means is that when they show up to work, they don't have to worry about being the nail that's sticking up. They can actually ask freely. They can do actions that may end up in a mistake and not be penalized for it. But you as leaders can demonstrate these behaviors, and you can emulate them, and you can introduce them. And slowly but surely, you'll start building up that psych safety. And then you can go on and work on dependability and other things. The two things at Google, what we find that teams struggle with is one is psych safety, and two is structure and clarity. If you have a psychologically safe team, generally, dependability will follow pretty clearly. It's, but structure and clarity is definitely, if you don't have roles, responsibilities mapped out, you can run into problems. So when I did this in front of my Labrador, it took me a little bit longer, but I have about 13 minutes for Q&A, if anyone has any. Um. You said about the Muslim person on your team with alcohol and inclusiveness. Is there a point where being inclusive is too much because you can't do anything? Like, okay, so he eats kosher, so we can't go to a restaurant which does that, and he's a vegetarian, and he doesn't drink alcohol, and he's sensitive to sun, and you end up <laughs> not doing anything. Yeah. So how do you, where do you draw the line at inclusiveness? Yeah, I, actually my team not too long ago had the, uh, the food thing I couldn't do for that very reason. I had severe nut allergies along with, what was it? Uh, someone was uh, ovo-lacto, someone was vegan, someone didn't drink alcohol. I mean, I basically gave up on any kind of food outings. But I didn't give up on all outings. I just didn't base it around food. I based it on something else. If it's someone is, is sun sensitive, then you do things indoors. I've taken them to do puzzles indoors or whatever. You, can, you just have to think about it. And again, it doesn't mean that you're, it's going to be the death of fun if you have to include everybody. You just may have to think a little bit harder on making sure that everyone feels welcome. And again, maybe not everyone will show up, but you definitely got to try at least a pretty good try on making sure that you're not always excluding this one or two people because it's too hard, right? That's not the message you want to send. Do you think all teams in Google are effective? And if not, what do you think is the biggest blocker? Uh, no, definitely, I wish I could say all the, all the teams at Google are effective. We have effective teams and not so effective teams, probably much like you. Uh, the biggest differentiator, again, is what we found, is that there are plenty of teams that I work with I work with teams internally on building their psych safety. It's psych safety communication is the number one thing that I work with on teams. It's like, how do you say things in a way where, again, it, I could say the same thing as person X, and if I say it, it's fine, but if person X says it, it just sets people off. Well, what is it about that, right? So good book for this kind of thing. It's called Crucial Conversations. People heard of that book? It's great. Highly recommend it. But that's one way to address that. But yeah, I, yeah, we're not, like I said, Google's not any better than any other tech company. Well, in some respects, it might be. Right. Yes. Um, does it work? OK. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I think it must be hard for you to talk about you know, having cancer in front of a whole audience as that. So I really appreciate it. I feel that you know, I, I'm a little safer in asking you questions that might be even dumb here. 
Um, I, I think one of my struggles is that just being nice is kind of abstract in general. Do you have any more concrete, specific practices, like for, for that first thing, giving people voice, right? Is there anything that we can emulate or, or try out that would be? Sure. So there's many things you can. One, one manager that I know at Google has everyone take, again, I know this is not science-based, but he has everyone take Myers-Briggs, for example. OK? And Myers-Briggs is good for, it's not based on science, because it's a personality test, right? But what it does is that it's, it shows people's preferences and where they operate. And so he kind of knows like where people are. So it's not about being nice, it's like, okay, like I know she really prefers this kind of work, or framing questions in this way, or really likes data. And then you just make sure that when you have a meeting with that person, that you lead with data, if, they, if that's their preference, right? So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to take these quick, there's a, I think it's called True Colors. And it's basically a free thing you can have people take. And again, it's the same thing. It shows work preferences. And again, it's not based on science, but it does have a self-awareness element to it. And what it does is allow you to say, look, I'm a blue. I'm not a blue, but I'm just saying, if I'm a blue in the true colors world, I really value relationships above other things. So my one-on-ones with my blues are completely different than my one-on-ones with people that love data. Okay. If the people that love data, they're green in this model, all right, I don't ask them how their weekend was. They don't care. And again, it's not because it's, they're, they're bad. They just don't care about that. Right? They want to talk about what they want to talk about. And my blues, we're talking about, how was your weekend? How's your daughter? How's this? How's that? We're always getting kicked out of the interview room, right? But with my greens, it can be very quick because we're just talking about data, 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 and we're out of there, right? But again, there's no cookie cutter way to be a good leader. You have to, I mean, I don't want to go into preacher mode. My, my dad was a preacher, and one of the things that always stuck with me is that the greatest leader among you will be a servant. And he said the best way is if you serve the needs of the people that you lead, they will follow you anywhere. Again, I'm agnostic. I'm just saying. I found that to be true. My people, and again, I'm, I'm not the world's greatest manager by any stretch, but two different managers and a VP told me, it's like, well, your people love you. And it's like, I don't do anything secret. Right? I just look at their needs and I serve their needs and make sure that they're fulfilled at work with little things like that. And then, so people, I mean, they, that really resonates with people. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Got about seven minutes, so fire away. So, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I just had a quick question about uh, you, you, you spent a lot of time uh, talking about what makes teams great, but do you have any suggestions of how to improve uh, like effectiveness between teams? Do these same principles apply? Yes. I mean, again, if it's, if it's cross-functional, which I think your, your question is, the number one thing with cross-functional teams is what I try to tell my folks because, again, we have... In, in Google land, we have the classic confrontation is SWEs, software engineers, and SREs. Because SREs are, we, we are basically, hey, we're in charge of production, and SWEs always want to change stuff, right? So it's like, sometimes the relationship is like this. But what I tell my folks when we interface with the SWEs is like, look, we all care about quality. We all want to do the best job. They have a different mission than ours. But what I use is the Stephen Covey example, which is seek first to understand and then be understood. If you do that, generally that will bring the level of conversation down and say, look, these aren't evil people over there. They have a mission. They're just trying to get it through. And they need to get through before Thanksgiving. And with the SRE hat on, you're saying, no way are we pushing that before Thanksgiving. But it's like, but we have an OKR to blah, 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 blah. And so if you put the, you know, again, it's just take that extra step and say, look, if I was a swing on that team, I can see why it's really, really important to them. So let's see if we can reach some type of accommodation. Doesn't mean you have to compromise your principles. But just going that extra step and trying to understand them rather than just say, no way, makes a big difference in cross-functional projects. So. Uh, outside of modeling uh, these behaviors and, and talking with team members about how to do them better, I mean, I'm wondering how, do you have any techniques to like uh, directly inculcate 
these kinds of uh, ideas you know, within team members uh, outside of just modeling them. I'm oh, sorry, I missed the middle part where you said to beyond modeling. Do you have any techniques for helping team members incul inculcate this within themselves? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that, that's it. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, what I always ask people is, this is one of those things where I do the, it's like the Jedi mind trick on my one of my daughters, right? It's like, unless it's her idea, it, it's never going to happen, right? It's the same, but it's the same kind of thing. Hey, Steve, I noticed that in that last meeting, there's a lot of people kind of like leaning back when you were talking about the production problem. Did you notice that? Yeah. How did you feel about that? And if they feel, fine, I was fine with it, okay, then maybe that's not the moment to say, you really need to fix this. But it's like, if they come back and say, actually, yeah, I, I didn't feel great about it, and I was wondering if maybe there's, there's some ennui or I, I want to fix it, and I go, well, you know, there, we can work on that if you're willing to, right? And then let's build on it. And again, plug for Stephen Covey, I use seven habits of highly effective people with my people for the people that want to, and I meet with them outside my normal work, and we just say, hey, read chapter one, let's talk about it, right? And for people that want to improve themselves, give them a lot of vehicles. Luckily at Google, we have a wide breadth of classes that are available that I don't have to take it all on, right? There's other classes they can take, but I'm just saying, here's a bunch of ideas, or here's some things to think about. Why don't you try this next time, right? And see how you do. But yeah, definitely, if they're, if they're again, you can't force it on them, but if they are wanting to self-improve, Go out of your way to provide the vehicle. There was one here, and then we'll, we'll get to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know who's first. Sorry. I'm, I'm bad at queue management. OK, I will go first. Um, so at Google, you found safety to be very important right within the team. Um, how do you see that working in other uh, domains, so not only software? For example, back at the SWAT team or at the police force? Yeah, again, police force on the patrol team, it wasn't safe, right? Very safe at all. In fact, I felt very unsafe. On the SWAT team, it was safe because, again, we had a, it was a different, different mission. We found, though, obviously Google isn't just a technical company, right? We have finance and legal and people operations and a bunch of others. And so their, their functions aren't technical at all. And yes, psych safety is still the number one thing that they face. And I work with a lot of the finance folks and legal folks on this very topic. It does, it does, we found that regardless of what your function is at the company, that pyramid holds true. Thank you. Yes. Uh, OK, over the years, I found that the method of building trust within a team that really works for me is like staying up till 2 AM, fixing outage with your teammates. And any tips or suggestions on doing it like less painfully? <laughs> No, uh, your, your team needs to respect you. And obviously, one way to build respect is, is to have that technical prowess. And it sounds like you have it, right? However, that's also not sustainable, right? You can't be up at 2 AM every single time there's an outage. So the one way is like you've done it once or twice. You've written docs. You've trained them. You, what you want to do is be able to replicate yourself to scale yourself. That's the only way it works. So the way I do, the way I'm, this is part of like my 120% project, right? I have my normal job. I still have to get it done. He goes, hey, it's great that you do speaking and stuff, but your, stu your stuff gotta get, has to get done, Matt. I go, I know, right? But what I have is built a, a fairly strong bench. I have a great TL, and I have a great program manager, and if I'm not there, my team runs as if I was there, right? And that's what you want to do. As a manager, you, a leader, you want to be like a doctor. You're always working on the elimination of your own position, because that's the only way then you can take on more teams and more responsibility. If you personally are up at 2 a.m. too often, you're not going to be able to scale that. Right. We've got about a minute. Any other questions? And I'm available until uh, I've got an interview at 3. I'm available. We can grab coffee or talk outside. If... I got a question. Question right here. Who has a mic? Right over here. OK. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Hey there. Um, one thing I've seen uh, within our organization is uh, fear of risk mitigation uh, trickling down to the individual contributor level and impacting that uh, psychological safety within the team. Um, I wasn't sure if you had any insights on that, or because um, be, obviously everyone wants you know you know as many nines as you can get, um, and you know to not have outages and, and customer you know facing 
problems, but um, how do you manage risk of the company versus the ability to innovate? Oh, that's a good question. So what, when I'm talking about risk and we're talking in this context, we're not talking about product risk, right? If you have an SLA of five nines or four nines or whatever, obviously you can't, you can't change that. But when we're talking about, when we say risk, we're talking about taking personal risks, risk at the interpersonal level. And those are the risks you can do on a small scale team and it won't affect the SLA SLOs. Yeah. I'll be available. Thank you so much for attending. Hope you got something out of it.